Good evening. I'm Hartwig Fischer, Director of the British Museum. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event, which launches our public program complementing the museum's new exhibition, Thomas Beckett, Murder and the Making of a Saint. The exhibition was originally intended to open at the end of October 2020 to mark the 850th anniversary of the murder of Thomas Beckett in Canterbury Cathedral. The pandemic forced us to postpone. And I'm delighted to say that thanks to the heroic efforts of so many colleagues, it is now due to open on the 20th of May, the 20th of May. Thomas Beckett lived a remarkable life. The son of a London merchant, he rose to become chancellor and friend of King Henry II and was later appointed Archbishop of Canterbury without having risen through the ranks of the clergy. Once appointed, Thomas Beckett would vigorously defend the interests of the church, much to Henry's dismay. And it is in the context of that monumental, long drawn out dispute between the king and the archbishop about the division of power between the crown and the church that Beckett was brutally murdered in Canterbury Cathedral on the 29th of December, 1117. Beckett's murder shocked Europe. He was canonized only three years later and a widespread devotion soon developed. Innumerable pilgrims from all over Latin Christendom flocked to his shrine in Canterbury Cathedral. Such was his, shame, uh, his, um, his fame. Miracles caused by visiting Beckett's relics are represented in the so-called miracle windows, which I'm thrilled to say are on loan from Canterbury Cathedral for this exhibition. The windows will feature in our next public event on the 20th of May, and we are most grateful to everyone who has made this unique loan possible. Pilgrimage to Beckett's Shrine has been evoked most famously through Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, which will be the subject of another event in this series in June. During the English Reformation, Henry VIII destroyed the shrine of Thomas Beckett in 1538 and put an end to the worship of the saint. You will be able to explore all these aspects and many more in our exhibition. It invites you to contemplate the struggle between spiritual and secular power, the role of worship and faith, and the vicissitudes of historical legacy. It is now my pleasure to invite our exhibition curators, Lloyd De Beer and Naomi Speakman, to introduce us to the themes and highlights of this fascinating show. Naomi and Lloyd are from the museum's Department of Britain, Europe and Prehistory, and we'll be answering your questions towards the end of tonight's event. So please post your comments for them in the questions and answers section of this Zoom. Naomi Lloyd, please share the exhibition with us. Over to you. Thank you very much, Hartwig, for that kind introduction and for setting us up tonight uh, for one of the uh, first public events uh, related to the Beckett exhibition. Hello to all of you. Uh, I'm at home in London, but sending my greetings to you wherever you may be. Usually we'd welcome you to the museum for an event like this. And on one hand, that's a great shame that we aren't able to do so. But on the other hand, it's extraordinary that we're actually able to reach so many more people through this medium all across the world. So uh, greetings to you again, wherever you may be. Both Naomi and myself are absolutely delighted to be here to share a very special forthcoming exhibition with you all, Thomas Beckett Murder and the Making of a Saint. We've been working on this exhibition for several years, several years before, before the pandemic struck, as, uh, as Hartwig said, it was to mark the 850th anniversary of Beckett's martyrdom, which was marked on the 29th of December uh, 2020, but in a much more somber uh, and socially distanced way. Despite the pandemic, we've been working hard behind the scenes to uh, finally bring you this important show. It's the first major exhibition about uh, Beckett's life, death and legacy. And as you will see when you visit, I hope you will. And 
for those of you who aren't able to visit, there'll be all kinds of other uh, public program events online and also a digital tour that we'll hopefully be putting up soon, showing you some of the select objects from the exhibition. So what we've done is we've brought together a remarkable array of objects from beautiful reliquary caskets to sculptures to manuscripts, but the absolute star of the show is an 800 year old stained glass window from Canterbury Cathedral. It was installed a few weeks ago and I can confirm for you it looks absolutely amazing and you're going to love seeing it up close. Tonight what we're going to do is we're going to take you through uh, the story of the exhibition. We're going to give you a sense of the objects that you'll see, some of which you might have already heard about. We've had some really amazing press for this exhibition so far. We've had some uh, good coverage of some objects, but there's many more to see in the show and there's some that we're going to release to you tonight. So you can think a bit of this event as a, as a kind of sneak peek. What I'm going to do is I'm going to speak for the, the first half and take you all the way up to Beckett's gruesome murder. And then my colleague Nomi is going to take you through his saintly cult. So I'm going to just, uh, yes. Oh, I should just give one very quick plug before we start for our catalog, which has just recently been published and is apparently a number one bestseller in the Catholic Saints category of Amazon. We're quite keen to stay at the top of that bestseller list. So uh, I'm just putting it out there for you all. We begin then with the crime. On the 29th of December, 1170, as the winter sun faded from view, Thomas Beckett was murdered in Canterbury Cathedral by four knights from King Henry II of England's entourage. The spilling of blood in such a holy place was profoundly shocking. It was all the more so because Beckett was Archbishop of Canterbury and this was his cathedral. After striking the fatal blow and with the Archbishop lying dead, the murderers fled the scene. Within days, miracles were attributed to Beckett, whose death was interpreted as martyrdom by his supporters. In recognition, just over two years later, Pope Alexander III made him St. Thomas of Canterbury, one of the fastest canonizations at the time. What caused the Knights to commit such a crime and what impact the events had across Europe in the 12th century and beyond are the subject of our exhibition, Thomas Beckett Murder and the Making of a Saint. Jewel-like gilded caskets, like this one you see on screen, enameled in brilliant shades of blue, red, and green, were made as containers to hold the relics of St. Thomas. Zooming into the lower panel, we see Beckett standing at the very center, facing an altar with his hands in prayer. Three knights rush in from the left with their weapons drawn, the first driving his sword into Beckett's neck. In front of them, two monks watch on, both raising their hands in horror at what they see. Above this scene are two further images. To the left, a group of mourners lower Beckett's body into a tomb, while to the right, angels carry his soul up to heaven. This shrine-shaped box is the most magnificent of all the earliest known Beckett reliquary caskets. It was made within 20 years of his death. It originally contained a precious relic of St. Thomas, this now no longer exists, but we can imagine it was perhaps a blood-soaked piece of Beckett's clothing or even a tiny fragment of his bone. This is the first object that you will encounter in our show, and in it we see two key themes of our exhibition intertwine. The story of Beckett's murder and his transformation into a saint. But who exactly was Thomas Beckett and how did he end up dead on the floor of a cathedral? On this screen, you see a kind of simplified map of London in the year 1200. The, the, um, you can see London contained within what, what was uh, the Roman walls of London, but were later drastically, uh, substantially rebuilt in the medieval period. Um, this is to give you a view of Beckett's London. You can see only one bridge crosses the Thames at London Bridge. This was Beckett's city. He was born here in London around 1120 to Gilbert and Matilda, who had emigrated to England from Normandy. Their family home was located on Cheapside, near to St. Paul's Cathedral, next to St. Mary Cole Church, which you can see on the map. This was the church where Beckett was baptized. Cheapside, then as now, was the commercial artery of London, and as Gilbert Beckett was a merchant, Beckett came from this mercantile family, 
the location here on Cheapside was perfect. Beckett came from a completely ordinary background. He was a commoner, he was not noble. And this makes his stratospheric rise all the more remarkable. Little of the city Beckett knew survives, but archeological fragments, these fragments that we have here at the British Museum, they help us to reconstruct his visual world. William Fitzstephen, uh, he was one of Beckett's clerks uh, when, when Beckett was archbishop, went on to write a biography of Beckett in the 1170s. He prefaced his biography of Beckett with an evocative description of London. And I really recommend if you, if you haven't done to read Fitzstephen's description of London, you can find it freely available online. It was written in Latin, but has been translated many times. It's, 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 in, it's one of these things that as a historian you wish existed, and, and in fact it does, and it tells you everything you'd like to know about London and more. But Stephen tells us that in the winter months, the boys of London went skating on the frozen marshes of Moorfields, north of the city walls. He said they bit their feet with shin bones of beasts, lashing them beneath their ankles, and are borne along swift as a bird in flight or a bolt, or, or a bolt shot. These two medieval ice skates that you see on screen are, are made out of cow bone, just like the ones that Stephen described. They were discovered in the city and their undersides, if, if you could feel them, their undersides are being completely worn smooth from repeated use. Beckett's London was a cosmopolitan city with traders and goods coming in from far flung destinations. But Stephen again tells us that from every nation that is under heaven, Merchants rejoiced to bring their trade in ships. Growing up in such a place had a huge impact on Beckett, a profound impact on him, and it, and it shaped the man that he would become. Throughout his life, he always thought of himself as a Londoner. And we know this because of a rare object made from one of Beckett's most treasured possessions. Only a few objects connected with Beckett survive to this day. At first glance, this red wax disc that you see on screen may appear humble, but it's actually something that brings us tantalizingly close to the man himself. It is the only surviving impression made from Beckett's own seal, and it's here attached to the base of a document. The device that made this impression was a highly valuable personal object, which Beckett probably carried with him throughout his adult life. And it's something that he used frequently to authenticate documents, as you can see on screen. You can think about it a little bit like uh, making your signature in wax. But the thing that we love about this object is that it also reveals something of Beckett's personality too. The text that you can see around the outside, uh, around the, in the center, but around the very outside, reads Sigillum Tome Lund in Latin, which translates as the seal of Thomas of London. This is how Beckett was known before he became Archbishop, and it shows that connection he had to the city of his birth. But for me personally, what I find truly fascinating about this object is what we see at the very center. Because here, if we look closely, we can see that Beckett selected a beautiful ancient Roman gem engraved with a standing male figure, possibly the god Apollo. Beckett's reuse of this much older object in his seal reveals his keenness to demonstrate his own interest in the classical past and to style himself as a man of learning, especially to all of those in his immediate circle. Beckett probably had his seal made around the time he started working as a clerk in the household of a man called Theobald, the then Archbishop of Canterbury. He did this in, in his early 20s, a few years after finishing his studies. Becker was fortunate enough to go to Paris uh, in his teens and to study at what were then the emerging Paris schools, which would later become the, the, the universities. He secured this position through ambition, hard work, a bit of luck, and also probably quite a lot of nepotism. In Canterbury, Becker joined a group of ambitious and competitive men who went on to become his colleagues for many years. Some of these men, however, in time also became his worst enemy. The Canterbury Beckett encountered in the 1150s was an absolute powerhouse of learning and artistic patronage. On screen is one of the greatest manuscripts made in England in the 12th century, and it was produced at Canterbury. It is called the A. Edewine Psalter after the famous scribe A. Edewine, who led on its production and was a man that Beckett probably knew personally. 
The book includes this remarkable image on screen. It shows the, 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 the cathedral layout as Beckett would have seen it. And it also gives us today a bird's eye view. At the top of the screen, you can see the church with the east end to the left and the cloisters below. The additional auxiliary buildings are those of the cathedral close and some of them still survive to this day. To the lower right, you can see a building labeled Aula Nova. And this is a particularly wonderful building that you can still see. And I visit it every time I go to Canterbury. It was the kind of hall of judgment, the justice hall uh, of the cathedral, which is pertinent really to the Beckett dispute with Henry. This drawing is known as the waterworks drawing because it shows how fresh water was pumped into the cathedral. This is shown on green, in green on the plan. And it shows how used water was pumped out, which is shown on red. It's, it goes without saying that uh, this kind of thing was a luxury at the time. In 1154, everything changed for Becket when the 21-year-old King Henry II took the throne. On becoming King of England after the death of Stephen, Henry brought under his control a vast span of territory with land stretching from the borders of Scotland all the way down to the Pyrenees in southern France. Henry himself had been born in France, his father was Geoffrey, the Count of Anjou, and he had spent almost no time at all in England. This meant that when he became King, he needed people he could trust, and he looked to the Archbishop of Canterbury, Theobald, for advice. For the role of royal chancellor, effectively that of his right-hand man, the Archbishop suggested Becket for the job. Henry accepted his recommendation, and the two men quickly became fast friends. They became, as we know, famous friends. The charter that you see on screen is one of the earliest documents witnessed by Becket as Thomas the Chancellor, the keen-eyed among you might see T. Canch, at the lower right of the document. And it was granted by Henry, by this young king, to the city of Canterbury, confirming its ancient privileges and freedom. At the base of the document hangs Henry's great seal attached by expensive green silk cords. This really is a thing to behold. In red wax, we see the king enthroned with a sword in one hand and an orb in the other, a demonstration of his majesty. This is really an object to come to the exhibition and look at close up in the show. For those of you who like Hilary Mantel's Will Fall novels, and we on the curatorial team do, we like to think of Beckett as the Thomas Cromwell of the 12th century, this Londoner from humble beginnings who from out of nowhere becomes a key advisor to the king. In the end, Cromwell sought to dismantle the church, whereas in a turn no one could have predicted, Beckett ends up becoming its staunch defender. This happened um, because in a surprise move eight years after his appointment as chancellor, Henry selected Beckett as his preferred candidate to become the Archbishop of Canterbury. This was the most senior church position in the country and it came with immense wealth and power. Beckett was wary at first, but he was soon persuaded to take on the job. His transformation from courtier to archbishop needed a careful bit of stage management. And in a sense, we can think of it a bit like a public relations exercise. Beckett was not a priest and he had shown little inclination for church life. As chancellor, he was well known for his extravagant lifestyle and had even fought several times uh, overseas on the king's behalf. This, this is not exactly the behavior expected from a future archbishop. Beckett was ordained a priest the day before his consecration as archbishop, which took place on the 3rd of June, 1162. This alabaster panel that you can see on screen, which was made centuries later for an altarpiece, shows us the grand ceremony. Dressed in blood red, Beckett sits between two bishops who place their hands on his mitre, a symbol of his new status. In his left hand, Beckett holds another symbolic object called a crozier, and this was his staff of office. Above him, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit preside, indicating that his new role came with the highest possible endorsement. Beckett might have been right to be wary of taking on the archbishopric. His fall from grace was swift. The king's original plan was for his friend to continue as chancellor as well as archbishop, giving him greater control over the church. In a shock move, Instead of supporting Henry's plan, Becket renounced the chancellorship, widely seen by Henry as a betrayal, 
and began to oppose the king's move to exercise his authority in church matters. Over the next two years, Becket was increasingly at odds with the king and eventually became an outcast. He was persona non grata. With tensions escalating and fearing for his life, the archbishop escaped across the channel for what would be a prolonged exile. A group of rare manuscript pages called the Becket Leaves, the first of which you can see on screen, were made in the 1200s. So we're talking about 50, 60 years after Becket's death. They were part of an illuminated life of Thomas Becket, a kind of comic strip style version of what took place in his birth, life, death, and, and miracles. The ones that survive, beginning with the ones you see on screen, tell us the story of Becket's six years abroad in exile with Henry very much in the guise of the baddie. There are four double-sided leaves surviving with 15 images in total, but because time is limited, I'm gonna show you just three of them here. In these two scenes, we see Henry seated to the far left and he's ordering his knights to send all of Becket's family into exile. In the Middle Ages, if you were exiled, you sometimes a lot of people were sent into exile with you. This was not a good situation to be in. In Becket's case, the king had also deprived him of his vast wealth and estates as Archbishop of Canterbury, which meant that he struggled to support himself, let alone all these other people coming to join him. And what we see here is that the king's knights in this image are pushing and shoving at a worried group. You can tell by the expression on their faces that this is an extremely stressful situation. They even go so far as to trample a woman at the bottom right who clutches a baby to her breast. This is Herod and the massacre of the innocents, if you see the biblical reference there. In complete contrast to the scene on the left, looking at the right-hand scene, we see Becket wearing his mitre, the words STH, St. Thomas, to identify him. He's reclining in bed, sick from worry over his fallout with the king. Moving on to another image, we see Henry, the king's most blatant snub of his old friend uh, Becket's authority as archbishop. And this was the king's decision to have his son, who was also unhelpfully for us, also named Henry, crowned joint monarch in June 1170. This is the scene that we see taking place on the left of the screen. To crown a monarch was the ancient right of the Canterbury archbishops, and it still is today. By allowing Becket's rival, the Archbishop of York, who we see just to the right there, crowning uh, the young king. So in the middle, you see a figure and above his head, it says, H, uh, it says uh, Rex H Jr., uh, Henry, Henry, Henry the Jr., Henry the young king. And to, to the right, there's a standing figure with the red text above says um, Archiepiscopus um, um, Roger. So Archbishop Roger Pontlevac is the man uh, performing the ceremony. Um, and by allowing this man, the Archbishop of York, to perform this, this, this ceremony, the king was really stirring things up. To the right of this scene, we see Henry the king handing his son Henry a golden cup at a fabulous coronation banquet. Becket was extremely frustrated by this snub. He appealed to the Pope, who in turn pressured Henry into promising to restore Becket's rights as Archbishop of Canterbury. He also reassured Becket that it would be safe to return home. And this is something we see taking place in this image. In December 1170, after six long years away, Becket returned to England. Here in this image, Becket is shown in the middle of a boat with his hands raised in blessing. The, word, the letters STH again help us to identify the figure. He is greeted on the shores of Kent by a mostly welcoming crowd. You can see lots of figures standing there to welcome him back, but you can see similar kinds of knights who point their fingers out and wag them at him as he, as he arrives back. But Becket did something before leaving France which would come back to haunt him. Without the king's blessing, he severely punished those involved in the unauthorized coronation, issuing a sentence of excommunication on them. This damning act was to have devastating consequences. The Becket, the, sorry, excuse me, the bishops Becket had excommunicated traveled to Henry's court in Normandy to relay the archbishop's actions to the king. The thing is, the king had already heard the news. Henry was in a rage and loudly railed against the archbishop. And we, we know this moment famously as, will somebody 
rid me of this meddlesome priest? Will somebody rid me of this troublesome priest? This phrase was not exactly what Henry said, but his words probably weren't far off. One of Beckett's later biographers records them as, what miserable drones and traitors have I nurtured and promoted in my household, who would let their Lord be treated with such shameful contempt by a low-born clerk. What we do know for certain is that the King's outburst prompted four knights, Reginald Fitzurse, William de Tracy, Hugh de Morville, and Richard Brito, to travel to Canterbury in search of Becket. They arrived, things got out of hand, and after a flurry of sword blows, Becket was left dead on the flagstone. We know, we know a lot about what took place that day because five eyewitnesses wrote down what they saw. In a sense, this is as close to contemporary reportage as we can get. The first account was a letter composed by a man called John of Salisbury, who is one of Beckett's closest advisors. Copies of this letter circulated throughout Europe, taking news of the crime far and wide. One of the earliest known images of Beckett's murder precedes John's description in this manuscript, which is on loan to us from the British Library. It is a lively and dramatic scene, remarkable for the illuminator's attention to detail. Beckett is interrupted at dinner by the knight's arrival at his palace in Canterbury. They wait outside the door while a servant announces them. Below, having pursued the archbishop into the cathedral, the knights kill him. Kneeling before his attackers, Beckett is struck in the top of his head while a man called Edward Grimm, who is the only person to come to Beckett's aid, stands behind him holding a cross-shaped star. He receives a blow to his arm. What is really interesting about this image is that between Beckett and the knights, a piece of the archbishop's bloody severed skull and a fragment from the tip of the murder weapon fall to the ground. This was said to have broken on the pavement because it was struck with such, uh, Beckett's head was struck with such force. In a, in a right hand scene, devoted pilgrims kneel down before Beckett's tomb. It's at this gruesome moment that I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Nomi Speakman, who's going to take us through the making of a saint. Thank you so much, Lloyd. And hello to all of you who are tuning in from wherever you are. But let's return to that night of the murder. And as you might expect, chaos ensued. None of those present knew what to do next. And for a while, the body remained where it had fallen. Eventually, however, it was gathered up and laid to rest on the high altar of the cathedral where it stayed overnight. The next day, Beckett was buried by the monks in the crypt in a rushed burial, and it's an event which is depicted with great sensitivity by the illuminator of the manuscript. You can see an image of that on screen. This is on loan to us from the British Library. And it's an emotionally charged image. And I'm sure you'll agree that the grief of the monks whose brows are furrowed in sadness is palpable. Almost immediately, reports circulated of miraculous healings connected to Beckett. One biographer even said that the first miracle happened the very night of his death. An extraordinary wave of miracles was recorded around 700 in the first three years. And in recognition of this, Becket was made a saint by the Pope on the 21st of February, 1173. At the time, it was one of the fastest canonizations in history. Becket's reputation as a miracle working saint spread quickly and soon people from all over Europe started to flock to Canterbury in the hope that they too would be healed. As well as visiting the tomb, pilgrims could also purchase a mixture of his blood and water, and we know that today as St Thomas's water. And this was distributed to pilgrims by the monks, and it was contained in small tin alloy vessels called ampullae, uh, but basically these are flasks. And the most remarkable of these you can see on your screen right now, it's in the British Museum's collection. And this is a miniature marble, and it shows Beckett standing at the center. And he's standing between two pretty threatening looking knights. These are the murderers. And their swords, you can see, project out from both sides of the vessel as they hold them up. Now, I love objects like these because they reveal something of the ordinary medieval person and what their own interaction with Beckett's cult would have been like. 
But you might be wondering, okay, enough about Beckett. I've heard a lot about him, but what about the king? Well, Henry was never able to escape his association with the murder, despite performing several public acts of penance, and it became a defining feature of his reign and indeed has done through history. This font that you can see on screen, so there's an overall shot on the left, but there's a detail on the right, was made around 1191 for the parish church of Lunche, and at the time that was part of Denmark, but now it's in southern Sweden. And this object shows how the king was implicated in the crime. I was fortunate enough to visit Lunche two years ago and see this beautiful sculpture in person, and um, I'm sure you'll all love it when you get to see it in the exhibition as well. The base, you can probably see this on the left, is covered in grotesque figures and animals, but the bowl is what we're interested in here, and Beckett's martyrdom takes up about half of it. Unusually, Henry is depicted ordering the knights to go to Canterbury to kill Beckett. He is hardly ever shown in medieval depictions of the murder. And we see him in the detail on the right. He's on the very left of this detail. He's enthroned and named by a scroll with the words Rex Henricus, so King Henry. He points towards a knight who turns to join the others who have already begun their attack. Beckett falls down beneath their sword blows and Edward Grimm remains standing at the Archbishop's side. Produced just over 20 years after Beckett's death, this sculpture also demonstrates the speed with which Beckett's cult spread beyond England. Beckett was popular from Iceland to Italy and images of him decorated churches across the continent and indeed they still do today. Reliquary caskets made to hold Beckett's precious remains were sought far and wide and what you can see on screen now are two beautiful examples made in Limoges, like the very first casket from the Victorian Albert Museum that Lloyd told you about, but these two are in the British Museum's collection and both were made between 1200 and 1210. A surprising number of these Limoges Beckett caskets have survived, around 50 are known of today kept in churches and museums. But even more stunning is this golden casket made in Bergen around 1220, and it's topped by two fantastic dragon's heads that project out from the lid. It comes from Hedalen Stave Church in Norway, about 90 miles north of Oslo. It's already installed in the exhibition space, and it can't fail to draw the eye, especially as it glows under the spotlight. And it shows Beckett's martyrdom on the lower panel. So that's what we're going to focus on, the lower panel of the front of this casket, where a group of knights attack the archbishop. Now, despite being made in Norway, the scene is extremely similar to several of the earliest known depictions of the, uh, of the murder from England, with the broken sword point and the top of, top of Beckett's skull falling to the floor between the knights and Beckett. This is the first time it's been lent for an exhibition in England, and that's the same for the font as well. We are so excited to be able to include both of these in our show. But let's return to Canterbury. What you're looking at now is in an image of Canterbury Cathedral today, and we're looking towards the East End. And in the years after the murder, things weren't all plain sailing. On the 5th of September 1174, disaster struck and a fire ripped through the east end of the cathedral, destroying much of its famed beautiful interior. It prompted a colossal rebuilding project. The finest masons and artists took nearly 50 years to complete the work. Its crowning glory was a new golden shrine made for Beckett and situated in a chapel decorated with stained glass, polished stone columns and a mosaic pavement. And we're looking towards that chapel in this shot and it was truly like heaven on earth. Now you can see uh, in more detail what this space looks like today in the image on the left. And um, the space is where Beckett's shrine once stood. And around the shrine, you can see some of them in the image, 12 six meter tall windows brought Beckett's story and his miracles to life in glorious technicolor. When we talk about the stained glass, it is hard not to be excited because these windows truly are masterpieces of medieval art. The windows also contain the only known representations of Beckett's miracles, and they reveal the myriad ways he intervened in the lives of everyday people. 
folk from all walks of life, suffering with a variety of illnesses from leprosy to the loss of eyesight and even remarkably castration are shown being cured by the saint. Most of the glass was made in the early 1200s, but there has been loss, repair and reordering over the centuries. Seven windows survive in situ and the window that you can see in the detail on the right is the one that's on loan to us. It is the fifth one in the series. And if we return to that image on the left of Canterbury today, you can just about see where it usually sits in the cathedral. Hopefully you can make it out behind one of the columns. There is so much to tell you about the glass, but I'm going to focus in on one of the panels for the sake of time. And that's this. This shows the most sensational story, which is of a peasant called Aylward, who was accused of a minor theft and sentenced to castration and blinding. This is pretty grisly stuff. The story begins in the panel to the left. So uh, we're looking at the circle here, and it's the panel on the left, with Aylward standing at the centre. His hands are bound behind his back, and the items he was said to have stolen are tied to his body. A judge, this is the figure on the extreme left of the scene, is dressed in white and shown wearing a cap. He points at Aylward to confer the terrible sentence upon him. The next scene we move to is the following day, and this is on the right, so it's directly facing the sentencing scene. And Aylward is hauled before the judge again, so the judge is again on the left wearing white, um, and Aylward is pinned down under a plank. A man holds him by the neck and stabs his eyes. Another, wielding a blade, kneels down and reaches for his testicles. Moving to the next panel in the scene, which is the lower left panel, um, we have Aylward in bed and Beckett, dressed in red, appears to him in a vision. The saint makes the sign of the cross in front of his face with a staff. And when Aylward wakes the next morning, his eyes and testicles have miraculously regrown. He makes a journey to Canterbury. So that's the one which is in the middle at the bottom of the roundel. And along the way, he shares the story of his healing. Here, Aylward points to his eyes and a tree between his legs symbolizes his restored fertility. In the final scene, which is the one in the lower right, Aylward, like all good pilgrims, arrives at Beckett's tomb to give thanks, and we see him here bending over in prayer. For hundreds of years, pilgrims travelled to Canterbury to worship St Thomas. The most famous of these are Geoffrey Chaucer's fictional pilgrims from the Canterbury Tales. It's a poem written in the late 1300s that centres on a bawdy group and their springtime trip to Beckett's shrine. It begins at the Tabard Inn in Southwark, where the characters spend the night before setting off. To pass the time on their journey, they tell a series of tales in a contest set by the innkeeper. On loan to us from Cambridge University Library, what you can see on screen is one of the earliest complete collections of Chaucer's poetry, and it dates from around 1400 to 1425. It contains images of Chaucer's characters, including the wife of Bath, who is shown here. And it's this opening, we have it shown in the exhibition, which is at the end of the wife of Bath's prologue and the beginning of her story. You can see her on horseback. She's carrying a whip in her hand and she's wearing this wonderful voluminous headdress. She's one of Chaucer's most entertaining characters. She was married five times and was an intrepid pilgrim traveling as far as Jerusalem and Spain. But Chaucer's poem was left unfinished, and so his characters never made it to Canterbury. But for those real pilgrims arriving at the cathedral, we can imagine that it must have been an otherworldly experience. If we just think about it, the church would have been filled with the sounds of chanting, the smell of incense, and there were breathtaking works of art to see, not least Beckett's extraordinary jewel-encrusted shrine. What you can see on screen now is one of the very few pieces of that ornate structure to have survived. It is a pinky red marble capital, which was found in the River Stour in Canterbury in 1984. It formed part of the stone base of the shrine and I will tell you more about how it was destroyed later on. But you might be wondering what that shrine looked like. And you can see that here in this reconstruction of the shrine and the shrine area. 
Now, this was produced by our great colleagues at the Centre for Christianity and Culture at the University of York. And this film will be on display in the exhibition and we'll be showing it alongside the shrine fragment. But I'll talk you through a little of what you're looking at. So this is Canterbury, this is Trinity Chapel around 1408. At the centre is the shrine. So at the bottom is that pinky red marble base and you can see that it's topped by this gold and jewel encrusted casket. And over the top of that is this much larger box that almost looks like it's levitating. Now we know that the casket was covered by a larger box that was raised and lowered um, at certain times and for special occasions. But you can also see that the shrine area is populated by different people. The monks here are attending to the shrine. There are pilgrims coming forward to kneel and worship. In the back, you can also see another group of visitors and a monk is pointing out to them the different uh, gems and uh, jewels set into the casket and he's telling them the names of the donors. You can see around the edge also, well, uh, you can return and see this on YouTube as well, but around the edge also um, visitors are looking at the miracle windows themselves. Now, at the end of a trip, pilgrims would also buy badges as a souvenir to take home, which they proudly wore pinned to their clothing. The range on offer was remarkable, and at the British Museum, we have one of the largest and finest collections of Canterbury souvenirs. Over 20 of these will be on display in the show. From images of Beckett on horseback, which you can see on the left, to miniature versions of the shrine, to bells inscribed with St Thomas, and my personal favourite, which is the second one on the screen, even tiny swords with detachable scabbards representing the murder weapon. These were cheap and quick to produce and transmitted some of the healing power and status of the holy site back to pilgrims' communities. But why does so little of Beckett's incredible shrine survive today? Well, let's return to, uh, there we go. So to answer that, we are turning to the Tudor King, Henry VIII, and the religious changes taking place during his reign. For centuries, St Thomas was popular with English kings and queens, and to start with, Henry VIII was no different. He made the pilgrimage to Canterbury at least five times, and he even commissioned objects like the one you can see on screen. And this is one of my personal favorite objects in the entire show. This is a Jalux surgical instrument case. It was probably given by Henry to his chief surgeon, Thomas Vickery. And it shows on the back. So the detail that you can see on the right is the back of the case. It shows a very unusual image of Beckett's martyrdom. And Beckett is killed um, with spears going into his back. And there's a figure to the right leaping behind the altar for safety. By the 1530s, things dramatically changed. In 1534, Henry broke with Rome and Parliament appointed him supreme head of the Church of England. Becket would find himself singled out for attack. For religious reformers, St Thomas represented the defence of the liberty of the Roman Catholic Church and loyalty to the Pope. This could not be tolerated and Henry and his council would later denounce him as a, tra sorry, as a traitor. But first, one of the most shocking attacks on Becket's cult took place, almost like a second murder. And we return here to this image of the Trinity Chapel and that empty space where the shrine once stood. And that is marked today by a single candle that is kept lit. And you can see that in the lower right of the image. On the 5th of September, 1538, the King and his court arrived in Canterbury. During his three day stay, royal agents began demolishing St. Thomas's shrine, prizing off the jewels and smashing the marble base to pieces. They packed up its precious metal in crates, which were taken to London to fill the royal coffers. Beckett's bones were removed and a rumor spread that they had been burnt and the ashes scattered to the wind. This was even reported to the Pope who was dismayed at the news. It isn't clear what exactly happened to the saint's relics, and even today that remains a mystery. But we cannot underestimate how shocking this act was for one of the holiest sites in the country to be destroyed. But more was to come. Two months later, a royal proclamation declared that Becket was no longer a saint, and it outlawed his name and image across the country. 
And I'm just going to read a little extract from that order. It said, from henceforth, the said Thomas Beckett shall not be esteemed, named, reputed, nor called a saint, but Bishop Beckett, and that his images and pictures throughout the whole realm shall be put down. This sparked countrywide iconoclasm, and sculptures were taken down, glass removed or smashed, paintings defaced, and his name erased from books. Not everyone agreed with the king's demands, and there was widespread resistance to religious change. This book and the next one I will show you highlight different approaches that people took to removing Beckett's name and image. So here in this manuscript on loan to us from the British Library, a prayer to the saint has been carefully cut out of the manuscript on the right hand page, but the accompanying image showing the murder on the left has been kept remarkably intact. This book contains text for holy service, and it was originally used at the Church of St John the Baptist in Bronsgrove, Worcestershire. These pages, where the mass for St Thomas appears, have been treated much more aggressively, with thick red dye smeared across the text to render it unreadable. But one of the things I love about this manuscript is that you can still see the tiny illuminated initials shining through the dye. So it's here, with these two extraordinary objects, that we find ourselves at the end of the story in our exhibition, which show how, despite the tumultuous years of the 1500s, Beckett endured. Wrapped in red velvet and secured with golden thread, on the left of your screen is one of the few surviving relics associated with Beckett. It is held inside a gilded reliquary engraved with the words Ex Cranio Sancte Torme Cantuariensis from St Thomas of Canterbury's skull. The relic was probably smuggled out of England by a Catholic in the last decades of the 1500s and in doing so they were taking a great personal risk. It was taken to the safety of the Jesuit College of saint Omer, where it was protected, and in the middle of the 1600s, a shining silver statue of Beckett was made to hold it, which you can see on the right of your screen. Here, St Thomas stands with a sword wedged deeply in his head and one arm raised defiantly in blessing. The two holes at the breast, which hopefully you can make out in the image, show where the box was attached. Held aloft on a staff, the ensemble was carried in religious processions and served as a material reminder of the ongoing resistance to royal authority. Connecting the moment of Beckett's medieval martyrdom with the fragile survival of his cult throughout this time of early modern persecution. Over the course of 500 years of history, we followed Beckett's journey from London to Canterbury and all across Europe, much like our own research for the show. And although our exhibition ends here in the 1600s, Beckett's legacy continued and we'll be exploring some of that through the public program. To this day, Beckett divides opinion. For some, he remains a martyr and a saint. For others, a traitor and a villain. But we will leave you to make up your opinion when you see the exhibition for yourselves. Either way, his is a remarkable story. Um, the story of Thomas of London, born in Cheapside, who defied the king and paid the ultimate price. Thank you. And I'll now pass back to Hartwig for the Q&A. Thank you very much, um, Naomi and, and Lloyd. Uh, that was a wonderfully inspiring introduction to the, um, this fascinating exhibition um, that raises so many questions. And some of these questions um, are now posed to you. Um, um, fascinating questions, very pertinent questions. And I will start with one from um, Sam Murphy. Does the fact that the sources are all from the church not discredit their positive depictions of Beckett? Were there any contemporary sources that painted Beckett in another light? The Maybe I'll take that one, Naomi, and then you jump in if you'd like. Um, yes, it's a very, it's a very pertinent question. That certainly um, all, all the sources that deal with Beckett's martyrdom and his sainthood are from leading churchmen, and so that means that they are uh, incredibly biased. And you can you can feel them in the text working their way backwards and trying to make sense of the fact that this secular 
individual who is made uh, a prince of the church and trying to understand that in 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 their day but also using the 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 tradition of hagiographic writing the tradition of writing saints lives to to promote beckett um as a saint there are uh, many other sources for the opposite side they they're not quite so um dramatic or as interesting as the lives but they they're mainly letters uh letters sent by by other leading churchmen who hated Beckett. And I mentioned them in my talk, people he encountered early on in his career, particularly a man called Gilbert Foliot, who was the Bishop of London. I mean, he wanted to be Archbishop of Canterbury. He loathed Beckett. And he writes all kinds of awful things about Beckett. Um, Henry II, soon after the murder, uh, didn't seek to absolve himself from the crime and actually wrote a letter to the Pope saying, you know, basically, I didn't do it and, and let me off kind of thing. Um, so there are lots of other documentary sources that do that do speak to the other side of it, but certainly the the, the sheer number, the volume of sources that survive from the the side of the church is is quite overwhelming. But as 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 historians, we 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 weigh that up constantly, and certainly that's how we think about it in the exhibition and in the accompanying catalogue. Nomi, I don't know if you wanted to say something to that. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head there, but there's an interesting question here, I guess, about how we interpret these sources. And that is something that certainly people are doing in the 1500s, especially religious reformers, who are questioning um, whose fault it really was and whether Beckett brought it all on himself. And, and they would have argued, and they certainly did argue, that he started it all. He started the fight um, and that the knights were were sort of coerced into it. So this question of how reliable these sources are is one that has been, um, people have been pondering for centuries. Could I, um, could I pick up at this point um, with a question by uh, Elizabeth Staplins. Was it general practice for secular rulers to choose high level clergy? How did the papacy respond to uh, respond or how strong was the papacy 12th century England? It's a fascinating, fascinating um, the question. Uh, an Archbishop of Canterbury is elected by the monks of Canterbury Cathedral. Uh, they, they elect the Archbishop and the King makes, makes a recommendation. Uh, so, but you'd be quite fool, the monks would be pretty foolish to refuse the recommendation it, it, it's in their interest really to to accept so so the the king sends sends people on his behalf to go when the monks are electing to say i'd really like this guy thomas beckett to be the to be the archbishop so he doesn't have the power to actually appoint but he has incredible power to sway the judgment of those appointing of course this didn't always happen in the middle ages and people did did refuse the um, the the king's nomination no. and and um, now it, it, it didn't make any difference if this was an ordained priest or not. Or was, was that unusual? Well, Beckett ha did have to become a priest before he was consecrated. Interestingly for Beckett, that took place the day before his consecration. And, and I think that's one of these pieces of evidence that um, shows us that Beckett was not someone who had lived a a priestly life uh, or, or life in the church. But I think turning back to this question about the papacy and electing the archbishop, wanted to give a slightly later example, which is from the early 13th century. And it's the Archbishop of Canterbury called Stephen Langton. He was archbishop at the time of uh, King John. He's also very important for Beckett's legacy because he was one of Beckett's great champions in the 13th century. Uh, he was also central to the writing of Magna Carta, uh, the translation of Beckett's remains into the new shrine. But it's quite interesting, the circumstances of Langton's appointment to the role, because um, that arose from a dispute between the monks and the king. So the monks of Canterbury had someone they wanted to put forward and did put forward. But the king had someone else in mind and neither could agree. So they went to the... Um, papal curia to try and have this resolved and the pope re strongly recommended uh, someone else who was Stephen Langton who was a scholar based in uh, Paris and trained up in the Parisian schools and this um, meant that 
he was appointed, but John was very mistrustful of this man who he saw as an outsider. And the association between Langton and Beckett is a very interesting one, which we don't have time to cover now, but Langton did not come to Canterbury for six years because of his own dispute with his own king. So he was in France in exile for the same period as Beckett. He even went to Pontigny, which was one of the places Beckett went in exile. And he sort of saw himself as Beckett's heir, except that he was not murdered. So let's go back to the murder a little bit um, more. Um, here is a question by um, Britta Turp. I'm close to finishing John Guy's Thomas Beckett. Yeah, the famous biography, obviously. Um, and considering the length of time Henry and Thomas were at loggerheads, and considering that Henry was king by divine right and all powerful, wasn't Thomas Thomas's murder inevitable? Oh, as historians, I don't think we ever use the word inevitable. So <laughs> it's very interesting to hear that. Um, it's a good question because. To some extent, Beckett was a bit of a belligerent. We know he was a hothead. Henry II also was a famously hot-headed person. Um, but I don't think Henry ever intended for Beckett to die. Whilst we certainly know that English kings had countless disputes with their archbishops of Canterbury, and like with Langton, but several others, archbishops of Canterbury did flee overseas in exile it's incredibly unusual for the most senior churchman in the land to be murdered in, as we said in the talk, the, the most sacred place in the country. Um, and the evidence points to the fact that Henry wanted him arrested and to face some sort of judgment. My feeling on the matter is that that's also what the Knights intended to do, but when they got to Beckett's palace and they found that he was arguing back. And he's also a big man, he physically wouldn't go with them. Um, and he was e even shouting insults at them. That matters just spiraled out of control. Lloyd, what is your take on that? Are, are you, are, are you as, as specialists and historians, are you bo both agreed on that? Yes, I think I do. I think I do agree with Naomi. I, I think, I think, even even up until, I mean, it's interesting, you know, because Beckett excommunicates these bishops before returning to England at a time of fragile peace, and some people say that this this is that he was he was creating a situation that would that would inevitably lead to his death because Beckett was obviously quite an ambitious, power hungry guy, and what's you know what's better than being an archbishop than being a pope? You could really um, stick it to you could really stick it to the king by becoming a saint, a martyred saint. So, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a tantalizing thought, but I think, yeah, even, even at that moment in 1170, when he returns, there was some hope of resolution, but it wasn't to be. I mean, that's one thing we explore in the exhibition is the power of, of, of events to shape the course of history. You know, we're living through one of these epochal events now that, you know, everything, everything is different now than it was last March. And we didn't know that, this was happening and they didn't know that Beckett was going to be murdered, but it, it certainly changed the course of, of English history and European history. Um, so here's a fantastic question to end on um, by Gillian Robinson. Why was Beckett so popular and why did his cult spread so widely on the continent? This is such a good question. Um, <laughs> There are two elements to this. So I could take one part, the, the top down side of it. And Lloyd, you're welcome to take the, the, the popular um, bottom up side of the cult. Um, so why was Beckett so popular and so popular on the continent? Well, Thomas Beckett was not a man who was easily forgotten. Let's say that. And he ha was also one of the most influential people in um, Europe. And in his lifetime, he knew senior people in the church and he also knew many secular leaders across Europe. Part of that is because he spent this period, six years in exile in France. So when he was in France, he spent time with the Pope. He knew Henry's rival, the King of France. He was also a great letter writer. And we know that he wrote letters to um, Margaret, who was the mother of the King of Sicily. There's a letter that survives that he wrote to the King of Denmark. So um, when he died, he had many, many supporters 
who'd known him personally, who promoted this early cult. And also they um, also were given relics or, or took relics with them from Canterbury. So we also found relic transmission happening very early on. Um, so that's one side of it, people who knew Beckett. The other part is um, the influence of the King of England and successive kings and queens of England. So although Henry and Beckett in their lifetime became great enemies, within a few years, Henry became one of Beckett's great champions and, and this happens in 1174. And from that point onwards, he um, really promotes Beckett's cult, but also so, so do his family. His daughters marry to different dynasties across Europe and in those places we see dedications to Beckett, images of the martyrdom, relics all appear as well and it, this happens in quite a short period of time. The only I just add very very quickly before you leave is that Beckett dies you know in defense of the rights of the church so he becomes seen very much as someone who spoke truth to power and died for it and so that legacy is an extremely powerful one that the church uses across Christendom because there's all kinds of people all across Europe who are having similar kinds of difficulties leading church figures with their rulers and they they use Beckett so Beckett's cult goes mad in Norway and Scandinavia particularly in Norway where the archbishop there is in exile and having trouble with his uh with the king of Denmark and this is a way of saying hey you better be careful because you know look at what happened look at what happened to Beckett and look at what happened to to when you push when you push the church too far and so he Beckett's a great tool in the years that follow yeah. his martyrdom. Yeah. I'm afraid we will have to draw to close now, but it's very clear that we could talk for hours and then listen to you um, and, and learn more about this absolutely fascinating and, and very telling um, story and history, which I think speaks to the day too. Um, so I would like to thank our audience um, for joining us tonight. Um, I would like to thank them for their brilliant questions um, and apologize for those who could not, I could not put forward to uh, Naomi and, uh, and Lloyd. Do come and visit the exhibition. Um, it's a brilliant exhibition. It is fascinating. It is, is enchanting. Um, uh, don't miss it. And um, by the catalog, uh, you can prepare your visit like this. You can read after visiting the exhibition. It's a wonderful book. Um, so we all look very much forward to welcoming you back to the British Museum once we are open uh, to explore our wonderful exhibition um, about St. Thomas Beckett. Thank you so very much. And good Thank night. you very much. Thank you.